I've got Alistair Cook alongside me and Michael Vaughan. And we're just reflecting, not so much on Stuart Broad, because we spent a lot of time reflecting on him and his career, but on how and when you decide to quit. And I'll start with you, Alistair, because it was here five years ago. And just from a personal point of view, it's one of the most remarkable atmospheres I've ever experienced at the cricket ground when you announced your retirement before that test match. And so the crowd all knew that you were leaving. And I know this is going to be difficult for you to hear, so I'll fill in the details. But basically, everybody was, um, I think, grateful, actually, for the career that Alistair had had and mm. what he'd put into English cricket. And that was reflected in the atmosphere here. Time after time, you would go out to bat. You got a 50 and a century. So you were out there for quite a long time. And every time you walked out, they stood up. We, we, I think we calculated something like 14 standing ovations you got. And it was it got more and more fervid with every one until it culminated in you getting that, that century with the overthrows, which you'd done, you'd done here against Pakistan, hadn't you, in 2010. And uh, the crowd erupted, and you couldn't, you couldn't stop them. Do you remember? It was like, well, of course you remember. It was like two and a half minutes of emotion from the crowd. And we felt it up here. Did you feel that out there? Well, of course I did. I think that was a... That's probably the only time in the in in the prob in in the moment that I I, I got emotional. Um, it was it was a really interesting week. Uh, yeah, I, I was I've been sort of played it slightly differently to Stuart Broad. The series was was gone. You know, we'd won the series. So that my decision wasn't affecting the team in the yeah. sense of that's why I decided to announce it before the game. Uh, you know, I was I've been in a lucky I've been a lucky few who managed. To, who've been able to call time on their career in when they wanted to, when I wanted to. So, you know, if you try and choreograph something, I don't know whether I got it right in terms of announcing the week before. Um, I think Agus read out my statement, um, actually. Uh, and then quite a few people called that I shouldn't play the last game, which is quite quite right. That, you know, in one sense, I wasn't going on tour to, to I think it was Sri Lanka, the next one. Um, they wanted to give the other, the other open who might come in a, a chance to play. That was their reason. So... Uh, it was an uncomfortable week, and the fact that the the attention was all about all about me, which is not not not, not the nicest place in one sense, because I'm still desperate to try and score runs, and everyone taps you on the back saying, "Oh, it doesn't matter this week, just go and enjoy it." Well, you walk out to bat and you get a brilliant ovation on day one. The last thing you want to do is tail between your legs, getting a naught and being on a pair or something in your last game. So there was that professional pride of wanting to to go out scoring some runs, um, but yeah, look, it couldn't have gone. Like any better. Well, do you know, um, in the commentary box, it's kind of weird. None of us wanted to get you out either. <laughs> so we had this. We had who this did? Who, who batted? Who, uh, who bowled think, the ball? Which got was me, it? Uh, was it Agus or no. I, Agus got you out. Oh, I got you hundred. And, and um, <laughs> it was. It was me, I didn't know was, that. I've never heard me getting out on radio. I've yeah. never heard the final bit. There were three. Only three commentators for that game. But I don't think Isha did that game. It was me, Simon, and Agus. And we passed, when we got off our, our stints, we would pass the other an imaginary gun. It was Russian roulette. <laughs> and say, right, you've got 20 minutes to go now. You could be getting him out. Because no one wanted to have to get you out and have to do that rather, you know, genuinely sad moment of you walking off. So if that was how we felt, heaven knows how you felt. And now I was lucky enough to get your 100, which was the easiest thing you're ever going to call because you've just got the crowd who are all just shouting like crazy and you just let them fill the space for you. But, but taking your wicket was a thing that neither of us, well, all three of us would just desperately yeah. try to avoid. And actually when I was batting, I, I, in my mind, I've always, I've always said commit and watch the ball. Once I've worked out my method in 2010, uh, commit and watch the ball. That's what I said to myself, every ball. And in that innings, don't let, don't let this one be the last. Don't let this one be the last. That was what... That was my concentration method for, for, wow. that, for that inning. Um, and, yeah, look, I, the only time I generally got nervous in that game was actually when I was on 40-odd on the end of day three. Because on oh, day four, yeah. I'd organised, you know, a, a box of some friends to come, basically give them, give them free beer. They're farmers yep. and school friends. They're going to make the most of it. And I actually, I wanted them then. That's when I started about, I think we were playing until 7 o'clock because of a bit of rain delay or might have been 7 o'clock. That was when I was like, don't get out now because actually give them the opportunity. That was the only time I got like, above nervous to, to do well. But well, the effect done. of you in that game was that I remember clearly that they hadn't sold out the fourth day 
Um, when you were still in at the close of play, the remaining tickets got sold within an hour. Every single one of them. Because everyone needed, everyone wanted to be Where's there. Where's my cut of that? Well, <laughs> I don't think it works quite like that. You got paid by the ECB. So that's, that's where your cut was. Uh, but it was, it was an amazing thing. But what I also want to dwell on a little is that you're still playing. So you played five years after you finished playing for England. Whereas Stuart Broad, yeah. two days ago, was still a professional cricketer. I mean, he still is because he's got to stay in tomorrow. But he was a professional cricketer. He was still you know, playing for Nottinghamshire and playing for England. And then he's, from what we've heard, woken up one day and he's just said to Stokes on Friday, I'm done. And then he's told us all on Saturday, it's over. And then that's it. He won't play another game of cricket again. You, you have got and played County Championship and Bob Willis Trophy for Essex for the last five years. So what was going on in your mind that was obviously a bit different from what's going on in Stuart's mind? Because you want to just keep playing, but not playing for England. Yeah, well, obviously, when I made the decision, and the decision I... I I know the final time was Trent Bridge when I walked out. I, I think it was Ashwin got me out. I mean, Zoltz has just walked away from his computer, but I think Ashwin got me out in Trent Bridge and I walked off and I put my pads down and I was like, I, that was the moment I knew I, I wanted to retire that summer for international cricket. I'd, I'd had, I had a tough tour against Australia. Uh, in Australia, I got that 200 odd on that real green seamer at Melbourne. <laughs> but the, the series was done. Like the series was done, and that that bothered me actually because I should I went down there uh, in a good space mentally in terms of like I didn't have the pressure of captaincy, hadn't had the pressure of captaincy. Australia is a good place to go and bat. I've enjoyed batting in Australia in the past, um, and I just thought, yeah, I, I'm going to have a good tour here. I was hitting the ball nicely, and for those first three games, I just could not get the rhythm of, of batting. I couldn't get the my, my flow, I know I, I, I have gone through periods of that time, and that, that concerned me. And then you start questioning, you know, like, do I want it as much? So then you train harder, then you do extra sessions. Then it, it, it got to me a bit. Mm. Then I got that double under it. Then I went to New Zealand, and the same thing happened in the, New Zealand, those things. And Stuart Broad won't mind me mentioning it, but in one of those net sessions, at some stage, he said to me, and I don't know what he said, God, you're back early. Obviously, I, you know, I, not, I don't probably train half as hard as Stokes does then, but I was, I was always, I always sort of above the curve in my training. I like my fitness, I like my doing the gym, and, I, and that was kind of what kept me like, sane in terms of I'm working harder than the bloke next to me. That's how I operate. I'm never the most talented you know, batsman out there, but I grinded away. And when I started questioning those things, and I remember lying on the outfield in New Zealand with Chris Silverwood at the end of that, well, I've been, been out four times, so the series was done. And I said to Spoon, I'm not sure how much longer I can do this. So, I, and he said, well, you're just tired after a test, two, seven test matches in the winter. Obviously, one of the proudest moments, I hadn't missed a test match. So I've been on the, on the thing. But so go home, have a couple of months, and then play that Pakistan season, see how you felt. So I tried to refresh, but it already started. It already started mm. in my mind. I felt good in the first series. But as soon as then you're batting in the nets and you're not getting that, that same drive and determination to keep improving myself and those little comments the harmless comments oh you're finished don't you not back as much today that's when I started looking in the mirror and going well I, I think it's time and then when I made that decision then I you know I, the, the first person obviously I was going to tell was Alice and I remember I, I walked back to the hotel she was very heavily pregnant and I was like I'm going to tell her and often she I've told her like you know oh, God, I'm struggling a bit she's like go and have a beer and, and toughen up a bit go and have a beer the next day it's just one of those periods. And that's what you need as a player. You need, you need a lot of love sometimes. You also need a bit of harsh love. And throughout my career, she was very good at just occasionally saying, no, you'll be fine. Just one of those moments. Go and have a beer, go and see someone, and then get back on working on. And that's, and that's what I need. And I tell you, I got back. I was going to tell her that night. Um, and we started watching the Inbetweeners movie. Great fun. Laughing. Away. I thought, I don't want to ruin it now by having one of those conversations saying so. Next morning, walked to the ground, and sorry, anti-corruption ICC. I didn't hand my phone in, so I, I text her. Good old, good old manly thing to do. Text her, I'm, I'm going to retire. At the end of the series, wow. and you know WhatsApp's typing, isn't it? You see yeah. the, you see the other person yeah. typing. It's just forever typing. I was like, I was dreading it because I know I was going to get that message. But I felt I was going to get one of those real long messages saying, "Don't be silly. Blah, blah, you love, you love playing for England. You're still plenty good enough. Keep fighting through all that kind of stuff." I knew, I, I, this time I, I knew myself. And then all the words came back was, I know. Wow. So I was like, 
So that was it. She, she had obviously spotted something. She would never, like, ever, would never have ever said something to me about it. And then I was like, right, I need to go and tell someone else now. So I, I went to go out whenever it was that day, sat Jimmy outside. And Jimmy's not a great watcher of cricket, he doesn't. We don't often see him on the balcony, not because he doesn't, well, like, we're supporting the lads. It's just his method of dealing with playing cricket. And he's done work. I got him outside, just me and him on the balcony. And I like, covered my mouth and said, I'm retiring at the end of the summer. So I'm just checking that no one could see or anything. I'm paranoid, probably. And, it, and I, I did it in public so he couldn't react too much either. And I just wanted to see what happened when I said, said it to someone. And as soon as I said it, this like, weight was lifted on my shoulder. I didn't regret those words. And that's why I knew it was exactly the right time to, to do for me. Um, uh, and then it's just a matter of the process. And I didn't, want, I didn't want anyone, I didn't want it to be leaked out quietly or whatever. I didn't want oh, whispers about it. So. I told a couple of people, told Joe Root at the golf course at Southampton, the, before Southampton, um, and Stuart Broad, they're the only three people who knew. And that was before? What, that, so that that's, was fourth that's test. Fourth test, or, fourth test right. Fourth test, yeah. and then told the lads at the end of Southampton. I've been speaking to Agus about it as well. So Agus was the only person outside, and we, we gave it to him to read out. Mm. Um, he didn't give us a scoop. Well, <laughs> the problem, like all these things, you don't want too many... I, I, well, no, I didn't want did, too many people right to know thing. because, no, right it was a very, it is, for me, it was a very personal thing and I wanted to... And whether I got it right in terms of making the week about you, but, I, you know, I wouldn't swap it for the world. The reason I carried on playing is 33 years old. Physically, it's a very different thing from bowling. You know, bowling to actually go and churn out overs in county cricket. I still love playing cricket. I just... Something was missing at the elite level and I didn't want to walk... I didn't want to get dropped in one sense. I didn't want to walk away... Not on my terms. What was it that was missing? I don't know. I, like, to this day, I still don't know what made me change that thing. Like, actually, Vaughan, in one sense, and I don't know if I've told the story or not, but Vaughan, when I in the lift in, I think it was Birmingham, and I scored 700 test runs at this stage, and he said to me, you're going to be the first Englishman to score 10,000 runs. I was like, bloody hell, that's, I'll take that, thank you very much. I'll take that. That's a decent career. And that's what my goal was then. Like, obviously winning all the other stuff, but you'll have something, in my opinion, something which is attainable as a, a personal thing, which doesn't go above the team, doesn't go above selfishness, but something which makes my, me, me run. I used to run at five o'clock in the morning. Might make it hard for yourself. Don't run at, like, two in the afternoon. Run at five where, you know, I don't know why, but that's what I did. And that's why every morning when I went out, not every morning I went for a run, but the reason I ran at tough times or swim at tough times was because I wanted to score 10,000 runs. And then I think the day probably changed is when I did score 10,000 runs. And I woke up the next day and I was, it didn't affect me. It wasn't that life turn goal. And actually the psychologist did tell me that. I didn't believe him. Because I thought, oh, Jack Callis, I remember when we started discussing all this stuff about mentals. Jack Callis is right. He's got 13,000 runs, 300 wickets, wherever he's got. He just walks out and enjoys cricket. And he goes, I bet he doesn't. I bet he still wants that. And actually, now knowing what I... Throughout my career, actually, absolutely, he was still driven. It was still hurt and whatever. And I scored 10,000 runs, and something just changed a little bit. That, that I didn't have another goal to go. And whatever we then we tried other little things, and it didn't capture what I needed. And that it kind of then started to to to, to drag down. Because because we we set you we hoped that you were going to have the other goal. Because obviously people like me and Andy, well Andy's not here now, but at the start of every every summer. We go, how many tests does Cookie need to go past Tendorka? It's, it's only 15,900. You know, he's been re retired from international cricket five years. Mm -hmm. If he played those five years, he'd have gone past Tendorka. But of course, that obviously wasn't driving you. I mean, was, was going past Graham Gooch was your mentor to a degree, wasn't he? He was yeah, one of the guys who worked was, with you. Was. And he was England's leading run scorer with 8,900. When he went past him, how did. Uh, no, that, I mean, the, the, the best thing about that was was James Foster's text message to me where he just said, you don't have to listen to him anymore, do you? You can do what you want. Because obviously, like, he was my coach and used to bat. He said, don't worry about him. You're better than him now. Obviously, I was never better than him. But that was, so, no, that was never a goal to be better than to score more runs than Gucci. It was, it was just to get 10, on a purely personal batting term, was to get 10,000 runs. But if no. that goal had been 13,000 or 14,000, it might have been different. Right. But... I mean, some of the some of the ruts I went in as a batsman. <laughs> you know, 2010 before you mentioned that hundred at overthrows against Pakistan, I was averaging eight or something for six Test matches. So suddenly, like those, if I'd have set 14,000 as a goal or whatever goal was different, that's a, yeah. it looked miles away when you scored seven hundred. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it is goals can be limiting, but goals can be also um, 
they need to be obtainable. But how about since then? So you retired five years ago, and in that time you're seeing so many of the people that you've played so much of your cricket with still playing Broad, Anderson, Root, to a degree Stokes. I've played and, a lot of Stokes in, I've yeah. played a lot. Um, but it's him. made it, it's now broad, not, not that I wanted these guys to go, but I, I found the first year of commentating incredibly hard. I, I felt so emotionally attached to those players, you know, really close, because you, you'd spent so many times, so many conversations. You know, I didn't want to ever betray their trust. I didn't want to ever um, talk ill of them, because I know, I know how hard it is. And what, one of the great things, I go back and get two fours against Hampshire last week, and I remind me, actually, this game is incredibly hard, and I try, and you can very quickly forget that. You can very quickly forget it, because you forget the stress that the players go through. So I found that very hard. Um, Did you ever think, oh, actually, I wish I was back out there? Because you'd watch England's travails, especially at the top of the order, and that was, it was a big thing trying to find an opening partner for you. But then when you went, trying to put an opening partnership together, and there were lots of people saying, oh, Cookie, why don't you come back? We need you for the Ashes Tour, or we need you for whatever big series is coming up. Did it, did it ever cross your mind to reverse uh, your decision? I, I had two weeks. I had a two-week period, I can't remember when it was, after a couple of years, where I had some five reoccurring dreams in two weeks Ooh. about making a comeback. And enough for me to tell Alice, ring Jimmy, Rooty and Brody about it. And that was, that was like, it was, yeah, like it was a really strange couple of weeks. I, I, I ran, we started running again at five in the morning. I started doing this, I rang Jimmy, spoke to him. And in the back of my mind, it was always comebacks don't go well. And then Jimmy sent me 15 comebacks which went well. Boycott was one of them. Well, I don't, yeah. I, I, surprisingly, he wasn't on to Jimmy's list. But, um, <laughs> but, then, but yeah. then common sense prevailed. Common sense did prevail because then I started batting the nets and thinking about it more in the nets and actually realised, no, that it is different. And actually, the way I walked off at the overall 18 will never be beaten for me. As in, not beaten, I don't yeah, want to, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Cannot yeah. be topped. Mm. And the reason I, I stopped is that what, what else was there for me to get excited, really excited for? And, and a comeback, I think, would have... I think would have been wrong. I think it would have put all kinds of unnecessary pressure on, on me in one sense. And, yeah, it would have been exciting if for a little bit, I suppose, but... So if you'd received the text that Moeen Ali received at the start of this year from Stokes, which just said Ashes... No. You wouldn't have no. you wouldn't have replied lol, you'd have replied <laughs> no. no way. No, yeah. of course, absolutely yeah. not. No. And I, no, that is you know, that is as long past and it was just a strange it was a strange I think I reckon it's two years ago. So I reckon it was, it was just a strange And no regrets at all. I, look, I, I I can speak to every player who's who's walked away from the game. I don't have any regrets. Do you do, have I missed it? Elements of it? Absolutely I have. Because it is, as you, as everyone knows, you retire. It's one of the. It's a great privilege to go and play and battle with your mates, playing for England, and it's all I ever dreamed about. But um, what I've, I think I've retired pretty well from the international game is, I've accepted, I've accepted it, and of course there's little moments of, of it, but I've accepted my lot, and um, so no, I don't wish I was out there anymore. I don't wish I had those, those horrible, nervy feelings or the, the constant failures brushed with a little bit of success. So you, you'll, miss, you'll miss if they win this game, the beer at the end of the change room of absolute satisfaction, which I know we'll never get again in, in our lives in terms of what Michael and I have experienced as, as cricketers. You don't get that satisfaction. You have to find it a different one. Don't expect it to replace it totally because I don't think you can. Well, you played in Essex Championship winning side. Yeah, that was, that was, that that was, must be that was brilliant. And the, one of the reasons I played another year because I thought it was a big... My aim was to play one more year and try and win another trophy with Essex. That was when I finished. I said, I want to play one year. Let's try and win that trophy because it's a big step off, isn't it? I'm, you know, I was all about cricket, about trying to play, be the best batsman I could become and best leader I become, all that kind of stuff. And then if I'd have walked off of the Ovals, my last game of cricket, I think I would have struggled with it. Just, you know, it's a big cliff to fall off. Different from a broadie, slightly older, a bowler, totally understand. I was a batter, it's not physically that hard. So, um, so I wanted to go and try and win a trophy because I was, I was part of the 17 side and I played the first seven games but then I went away to England mm. uh, and actually it was the first time I, I left a, an Essex dressing room after those seven games thinking, Jesus, actually, we're a part of something special now. We've always, we, we, we underachieved for years as a side and we, we found a formula, well, Simon Harmer turned up and, um, <laughs> and, and, we've, and we've had a great, 
a great run and winning in 19 as a sub was brilliant uh, and that said well I'll, I'll try, play again then Covid got in the way in terms of like changed and I just I, I mean I, I loved the Bob Willis trophy five games a year I'll do that for a long time <laughs> but, um, uh, so that's kind of prolonged it um, I've been very lucky Anthony McGrath if you, you know you talk about McCullum and Stokes reinvigorating Ben Stokes uh, not Ben Stokes um, Stuart Broad's last 15 months in chat yeah. like the way Mags and um, Tom Westy and Ren, Ryan Ten Scott have kind of been able to captain me maybe just being able to go out and just play cricket and just go and it is very different cricket to international cricket it's you know, there's, there's very huge amount of skill you play in all kinds of pitches you know good bad brilliant every scenario is thrown into kind of cricket you get the youngster steaming in or you get really experienced pro it's um, but the, just the way they've handled me I've really enjoyed my time there um, and we're trying to hunt down Surrey for one, for another trophy. Maybe, maybe, you guys maybe, are... maybe next year, Alistair. That, that's fine. <laughs> not, not, not this year. Now, another England captain's alongside me. Who um, your, your circumstances of your retirement probably a bit different because there's injury involved. But your retirement comes really close to probably your crowning moment, the 2005 Ashes. Is it? You're a little bit closer to the moment of, of greatest success. Alistair's might have been say. 2010-11 with the bat and when England won away in Australia. Yours would be 2005 and not awfully long after that you've got a call time. You've got very different reasons or were they similar no, reasons I mean, to I, Alistair's? No, I mean, I, it was 208 really when I gave up the captaincy. I knew I, I was never going to play for England again because my, my body was knackered. My knee, you know, I'd had four knee operations, a real big operation in 2006 uh, called microfacture where the drilled into my joint it was it was nasty and I just knew that you know I was spending that much time on the physio bed and you know as Alistair said when you when you can't train and you can't do the things that you could do before and and, and Cookie didn't have injuries but he obviously just lost that kind of that mojo that you do um I, I, I lost it because my body was in bits so you still had the drive you still wanted it uh, did you yeah but I, I, I even even when I was no, 2005, around there, 2, 2, 2, 3. I, I never felt I was going to play till I was 38, 39. You know, I always had interest away from cricket, and I still do. I still have lots of interest away from cricket. So I love cricket, and I, I love playing it. Um, I never m missed the dressing room. You know, I left the dressing room in 2009. Uh, finally, I left. Uh, so 08, I retired the captain, saying he wasn't going to play for England. I remember in 09, Strassi was a skipper. He ran me up in around April, May. I can't remember why. I said, I want you to play some can't create for York. She gets some runs. Might pick you again for the Ashes. And I just went straight out of seat. Nah. Nah. He said, no, please, just try and get some runs and we'd like to have you in the mix for 2009. And I thought, uh, well, I'll give it a go and I'll try and play. But it, it just wasn't there. The spark wasn't there. So that's why I retired before the 09 Ashes. Because I didn't want people to start thinking, if I scored 100 for Yorkshire, I was going to come back in. And So I just decided that that, that was it. Um, you miss it. I missed it. I missed the game. I missed kind of being around people. But I didn't, after a while, miss being in the dressing room. You know, I just... And I, and I always got told that is what you would miss the most. Mm. You know, everyone said, oh, you wait until you, you leave the dressing room. And, you know, I, I found that buzz and that energy and that fun factor away from being in a dressing room, you know, with friends at home. And I actually found it a, a great release to just go back and... Um, I love the commentary box. I love being around people in cricket but I found it a, a, a great release just to go back home to friends that I'd been friends with from the age of 10 at it's school. in part because your team had also you know that high point of 2005 a lot of those guys I suppose I suppose Harmison was still around a bit yeah, but there was a few around was on his way was out pretty much playing Freddie was still playing yeah, yeah there's a number of them were still playing um, I don't know everyone's different aren't they I mean you know Alistair had the, the, the the, the best farewell and that's why Stuart last night when he retired I went brilliant that, that's a great way to go out you know wh whatever happens tomorrow Stuart Broad has, has in my opinion got it absolutely spot on he's had a brilliant career and you, he, he would he would probably have had those kind of thoughts for a while you know you, you, you were always talking to close friends about what you can do and what you're going to do next and also what are you going to do next you know I think as a cricketer I always say to, to young players it's very important that you know, you understand in sport that you're only going to play for a period. You hope to play for a long period, but that long period isn't that long in your life. So even if you played for 20 years as a professional from 18 to 38, it's an amazing career, but you're still only 38 years of age. You know, you've got the rest of your life ahead of you. So, you know, if you want to just stay in cricket, of course you can do. But I think it's so important that uh, sports people realise that 
there's something else out there other than the sport. And I think those that think purely about the sport and that's it and there's nothing else, you, you can struggle when you leave because how do you replace that feeling from being out in the middle? Because you do hear of lots of sports people who actually go searching for that buzz. You know, once they've finished, they go searching for a buzz. Uh, fortunately, I, I didn't really miss the buzz. You know, of course, I missed a cover drive or mm. celebrating 100. You know, it's a fantastic feeling. You can't really replace Winning that. Winning the ashes after yeah, 16 can't. years without it. Yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. And, and honestly, you can't. You, nothing can ever um, get to that level. But, you know, in life, you can have great, mm. great moments away from your sport. You know, you can have other areas of your life that you can get stuck into. And the dressing rooms that are great places, great fun places, you can find that in the golf club or... You know, even down the local cricket club, going to watch on a Saturday afternoon, you can get that same buzz and that same energy. So I just, uh, I, yeah, I, I never, ever had a period. I, I, had a, I had a period when I didn't know what I was going to do. When and was that's that? a bit confusing because in 2009 I retired. Um, that's how I started. Agus came to, I was playing at Scarborough. And from nowhere, I was warming up in the morning. And Agus came and he was driving up somewhere up the coast and he popped in to, to speak to me. And I went, hello, Jonathan. And he, he, he told me about Test Match Special, how... You know, he'd love to, to, to potentially speak to me about coming to join the Test Match Special Team. And I was went, wow, I was like overawed. Like, I could potentially be joining the Test Match Special Team. So obviously then I started thinking, oh, maybe I can go into the commentary box or a mm. bit of radio. Um, I'd, I'd got a few business interests that I was always going to kind of get stuck into as well. Um, but I didn't really know what I was going to do. And it was like a year or so, maybe two years actually, that I tried a few different things. And I came to the commentary box, I went to South Africa on tour, uh, tried a little bit of TV, a bit of radio, uh, a few little different shows away from uh, cricket. But it was really two or three years later that I thought, you know what, I, I really enjoy this. You know, I enjoy just sitting and watching the game and having an opinion and just calling the ball or having an opinion on certain aspects of the game. I, I, I've, I've really, if, if you said to me, did you have you loved playing as or commentary? I honestly will say this is getting very close to being the player. I really love being in the commentary box. Well, I, uh, really interesting to hear something. I will definitely miss the dressing room, just just for the fact. Not saying, but then I won't. I won't seek to try and replace it. You know, I love going in there and. You've got, your, you've got your sheep, haven't you? You can talk to. Him. Well, that's. I, I was going to just about to go on about the sheep now, and now everyone's <laughs> sick and tired, probably of me. No, we love your sheep. Talking yeah. about the sheep, but the one thing I, I've been lucky enough with is, is cricket is such a time based sport, isn't it? Mm. You know, you went away for an Ashes. You went away that. You went away for a Test match at home. Your next seven days are planned for you. Seven days, it's quite a long time, isn't it? You're like you turn up, you're two days training, five day game, all sorted for you. When you retire or when you stop playing cricket, that's a lot of time to replace, isn't it? Mm. And actually, uh, because of the farm, uh, that that time is is there already. I get up and if I'm down the farm and whatever, it, it's seven thirty to six o'clock, my whole day is done, and so I'm not worried about trying to feel time. So that for me is a really nice place to be yes i enjoy it we know how much everyone's probably bored of me talking talking about sheep and whatever and, and sheep dogs but it's you know i i'm lucky i'm so lucky that i've got that to be able to so then i'm not trying to as, as michael said what am i going to do i don't I, I you know i i don't know what's the next 10 years of my professional life and everyone kept telling me oh the cycle she, you've got to get something else to give you that same drive did mm. that well, actually I've given 17 years, or probably more than that, of the drive, determination to be the best average top order player I could be. Hang on a minute. Why, why do I need to have that drive? I can do something slightly different. And, and, I, and that's for me why I've, I think I've got a good, quite a good headspace about it. So you're not an adrenaline junkie that needs that sort of spark. But, but I think Vaughan said, you can't, cannot replace that. You could never, in a million, whatever Vaughan and I do for the rest of our life, we can't replace what those guys are experiencing. But I, I think the trick is, is not trying to replace it, is to accept that was your 20 years of living under the massive highs and probably actually a lot more lows and not very much on this middle line, which the majority of the kind of people live their professional life and a middle line goes up a little bit, goes down a little bit, then you had a good or a bad day. Well, and, I, and I don't, that's not being... being 
patronised, but professional sport gives you unbelievable highs. 2005, the, the Ashes. Michael Vaughan, that feeling, well, that image of him, I remember that. Because, you know, and what he went through as a, to do it is unbelievable. You probably don't remember any of it. But, you know, that high is re never repeated. You sit in the dressing room after, after the stresses and the strains of a five-day or five-day test match or 25-day series or an Ashes or... You cannot replace that feeling. Taking your boots off, looking at your mate on the other end and going, cool, we've been through a lot together in that 25 days. What's been brilliant and tough and it's sat the ultimate satisfaction of winning a series or winning a game. You can't, you'll never replace that. What's but the bigger high? Sc scoring the 100 from the ranks or being the captain of a winning team? Well, I think the, uh, you, you experience the, the high more for a longer period of being captain. So yeah, the only time I got ever emotional was when I, when Agas and I, Agas, um, Athers inches into, viewed me at Trembridge when we'd won that series 3-1. Obviously one more to go, we end up losing the game here, but, and, you know, I lost it in my voice a little bit. It's the only time over, in terms of like the, in public, because of, we were told we're not winning that series and we won it and that, that but the feeling of getting 100 or winning a close game with it's, that spike is, is unreplaceable. What was it for you, Michael? Because you, oh, you, had some, you had some terrific innings against Australia in losing causes, but then... Yeah, I mean, I, I love captaincy. You know, I really enjoyed um, just being out there and you know, tactically trying to work out plans and trying to manage people, trying to get uh, people playing better or playing in a different way or being a bit more aggressive or... Particularly, I, 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 had a, um, I, I love captaining Mavericks. You know, someone like Freddie Flint, I just loved it because he just had this amazing ability to take the game to the opposition. And I just wanted, you know, to, to watch him. <laughs> Basically, used to say to him, come on, entertain us on the balcony. When you go out to bat, you know, your job is to make sure you're entertaining us. So if you think you can hit it, give it a right good whack, please. Whack it out of the ground. Like Stokes was saying <laughs> last year. Yeah, I just, the I love, you know, Captain in KP. I, you know, I got Kev right at the, at the the best time when he was just starting I loved it because I mean he was a genius he could do pretty much whatever you told him you know if you said to him take on Murley he could take on Murley not many England players could do that but um, yeah captaincy I, the, the one thing when I, when I first tried I do remember for the first few years you start looking at oh no what could I have done differently and could I have played a bit more and could I have got a few more runs and you know could I captain Don and, and maybe done a, another year or so and could I have played another 20 30 tests to get past 100 so for the first two or three years after a time, I, I would say it was more negative thoughts about what I could have achieved above and beyond what I'd had. And now I look back 10 or 15 years after that and think, well, wait a minute. You know, I, I played for England for a long time. I captained England for a long time, scored a few runs, scored a few centuries. So now I'm a bit further away. I look more at the positive sides of how lucky I was to play mm. for, for Yorkshire and for England and to travel the world and to get this opportunity. Um, so it's kind of different periods of your retirement that you start looking at it differently. And I now look back at playing purely as a positive sense. Of course, I'd love to have scored a few more runs, but I now look at, you know, I managed to get 1800s, pretty good. Uh, managed to win a few games as captain. I'd have taken that at the start of my career. <laughs> I'd have taken the, the captaincy for one test, never mind 51. So I think as time kind of goes on, you do look at the game differently and you look at your time playing differently. Um, I wouldn't swap, swap it from any other era, I, I really generally feel I came into cricket in the early 90s where it was pretty much an amateur game played in a kind of professional setup. There was there was all sorts that went on in the county game. It was really week after week. It was sometimes like a stag trip with a bit of cricket thrown in. The cricket kind of got in the way of the stag trip. So it was bizarre. But, you know, I, I, that was at the start of my career. And then, you know, further into the 90s, professionalism, training, uh, ice baths, all these kind of different things came into the game. Then data computers. I remember in, in the 90s, you really had to, if you could find a clip of you batting to look at the way you were playing, it, it, well, you, you couldn't find one. Whereas now everything's on a computer. You can see whether, whether there's too much of that, I'm not too sure. But, you know, through the time of the 90s where we didn't have any of that to then it arrived, and then data came into the game and a bit more professionalism. And I've always felt there's a real fine balance. That's why I think this team are getting absolutely spot on with their method is that they are a bit casual. You know, they do go and play golf, but I get why they're doing this. You know, I get the mentality of what they're trying to achieve. And I think they have stripped back a lot of the data that was here for quite a while. And they're just saying, we just play cricket. And we play cricket with a bit of fun, a bit of aggression. We play this brand of cricket, we're sticking to it. 
and I can fully understand what they're trying to achieve. And whether that gets some success going forward, he's certainly got a lot more eyeballs watching the game, by the way, that they've played in the last 18 months, which is great. Um, let's see if it can have that next step in terms of winning a big, big moment in India or a big Ashes series in two and a half years' time. Do you think it made it a little harder for people in your era? Because so you, you're sort of describing, not your era, but the, the one you described in the 90s when you say, you know, bit of an extended stag trip. To leave that fun, and there's a massive handbrake turn <laughs> into reality, isn't there? Because in those days, there was, there was less media, so there were fewer opportunities mm. for, for people to work in that. There are probably fewer coaching opportunities as well with the proliferation of leagues that we have now. Mm. Uh, fewer commercial opportunities generally. So, you know, find a lot of players were on that merry-go-round, on all that camaraderie, and as Cookie's sort of described, you know, missing the, the dressing room. But then it's all, boom, it's over. Whereas now, you know, what Cookie's describing, and, and you as well, is... There's a lot of hard work goes into it now. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of concern over what you're doing. And if you're a, a, somebody who's devoted their life to batting, I remember talking to Graham Fowler about this, and he said he reckoned that if he was really honest with himself, if he took 100 days of his professional career, on average, he'd probably be happy with about eight of them. <laughs> Half of them he was fielding. And, you know, how much could he really do to affect it? He didn't bowl. And then when he batted, if he got 100, he was happy. If he got 30 or 40, he wasn't happy. And, of course, you're not happy if you're getting out in single-figure scores. So day after day, you're sort of unhappy. And what sustained him is the camaraderie, the fun, what have you. Um, but now, you know, England team sort well, of back getting in the day, back but, that but, sort of sense of enjoyment. I reckon back then, I remember when I first started counting cricket, we, we basically came back to Yorkshire on March the 1st. You know, that was when you checked back. So you were off from the end of yeah, September. Yeah, and I was lucky. I was on England under 19 tours or A tours. But, you know, from September 20th, whenever, there was there was always an end of season trip. There was always a PCA awards. And once the PCA awards were done and dusted by from the end of September to October, you just went away and, and you know, went back to wherever you were living. And you'd, you'd train with your county. We'd, we'd have Tuesday night, Thursday night training sessions at Yorkshire in the winter. You know, carrying logs around the streets of Headingley up to uh, uh, the university, but uh, up the top of the hill there. I always remember it in groups of four, carrying logs and then doing a the training. It's a bit like army training uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays on Saturday mornings. Uh, but we officially didn't kind of clock in till March the 1st. It was a seven-month contract. So you weren't contracted for the whole of the winter. You kind of just turned up and got a few quid for a bit of travel up from Sheffield, where I was living, uh, to Leeds. But... You know, so back in those days, a lot of players had, had jobs in the winter. When would that be? We're talking early 90s? Yeah, mid, early yeah. 90s, definitely. Some of the, the players would have a, a job or two in the winter. And then you, I always remember around January, February, uh, Yorkshire would pick their pre-season trip, which was always a great trip to get on because we used to go to Anguilla, Antigua, oh uh, Cape God. Town, Zimbabwe, you know, Bulawayo, you name it. It was Philip Sharp, the old Yorkshire player. He ran the pre-season tours. And it was like a big, big moment. I remember when I was at 18, I got picked on my first trip. I think it was to Anguilla. Oh, what a trip. We only played two games. Fantastic couple of weeks in Anguilla. <laughs> we were staying at... Well, it, it, was, it was a very, very strange hotel, but very nice. But oh. I wonder why our Essex trips are so good now with Mags leading. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. I, what I've just said, I love how you want to play and you love playing in the era you played in. So Vaughan, he spoke really highly of his era. I wouldn't swap my era either at all. Like, we've had, there's been elements of, very different, slightly like different. Like, I started in 2003, where you, you check scores on CFAX. Um, and, I, you know, you could say you got 40 when really you got 25. And, you know, <laughs> how do you get out? Oh, I was unlucky. And then actually, but now, can, like, can of cricket, there's live streams. And I, I think that's, I mean, it's brilliant. But again, it's the pressure that puts on every young batsman knowing that, there is zero hiding place now about. Do they go back and check out the highlights and well, see? How... I'm sure they do. I'm sure, yeah. but they, they're, they're more used to, I suppose, more used to it um, because they're used to all the social media stuff they've been brought up in. So I, I, I've gone through my career's been slightly unprofessional at the beginning, but probably a lot more professional than it was when you started to a real professional bit of England, and obviously now the uh, Essex, um, just a. 
you're going back probably another generation. Yes, our fitness results were really are really good, but we really appreciate how lucky we are, Essex, to to play the game and it is old school, a bit more old school, and that's probably why I've still enjoyed playing. What do you think the future holds for cricketers? Because you've described two sort of ways of being there, and now we've got a proliferation in T20 leagues. You're going to be sharing a lot of different changing rooms, aren't you? And Josh yeah. Butler talking about maybe signing a big contract that might see him play. He could be playing in the Caribbean, South Africa, India, Australia. Who knows? Who knows? I, I think, Dan, I think cricket, I, I, I don't think we're at that stage yet for those contracts. They might come in the next year or two. We'll have to wait and see. But I think cricket will end up being like football, where, you know, your big contract in terms of finance might come from a, a franchise, Rajasthan or a Mumbai. But like football, you'll have to wear your three lines. You'll have to represent your country if you want the commercial element to be a part of you and for for you to have a, a real legacy. I think you're going to have to do your work in the international but, arena. See, I, I, I find that sad. I know that's the way the game's going and there's there's nothing that I don't think you can do, really, unless the ICC like unbelievably subsidised test cricket, you know, to make it, to match those things because their players are always going... like. I, because A, of the, probably the style of cricket I played, but um, winning with your real true mates in a side which, you know, you talk about the captaincy, you said you love capturing Mavericks. I love building, I, I love the idea of building a team. How I wanted my team to operate as a, as a group of us, from management to players, you know, how, how we, you know, mix with the public and how I, I, I expected my team to, 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 to behave and I enjoyed that thing and as well as trying to you know improve I've got young Ben Stokes young Josh Butler trying to help them of course that's that kind of style as well but I really tried trying to mould a team that's what kind of I, I liked but you know I, I find it very different I can't quite get my head around it you just go and play different, all these different leagues and brilliant you get financially brilliantly rewarded for it but I've been my career about satisfaction about the career I've had and the moments I remember is winning with the, the people closest to you, whether it was 2019 when we sat at Taunton, that group of players, as that squad of Essex players winning the, the county championship, you know, only probably 60 people really cared in one sense. But, you know, that's, but for those group of 20 players and start, support staff, it meant the world to us. And we sat there and that coach journey home from Taunton to, to Chelmsford, I will never forget. And, and that's what I remember. You go to a franchise league and you win, brilliant. You win the trophy, but you're winning with people you're only going to be friends really with for three weeks. Mm. And that's what I can't get around. And that's, that, that's what's happening. And it's a fair play to everyone. But I don't know whether I would get as much motivation to do that as I would from winning with players that I've, it's that I've, I've, uh, that I've grown up playing with and, done, and we've gone on that transition as a side from being not a good side to a winning side or, or, or vice versa. It's one I mean. of the remarkable things about the county championship. I mean, you play so many games, really. 14 games, four-day games. I mean, and I've, I've been there when a few teams have won county championships. When you won at Taunton, I remember commentating that game. I could see how much it meant to your team. I was there at Lords when Middlesex beat Yorkshire in that run chase mm. and denied Somerset. And in the tavern afterwards, I mean, I'll just never forget seeing Ollie Rayner with his kit still on. Mm. Pulling the pints That's for it. everybody there and the glee. I mean, there's it's, it's a marathon, isn't it? It's yeah. an absolute marathon, and it's a side which almost doesn't collapse and it mm. doesn't hit the wall at the side wins the league. Yeah, you don't often blow the, the league out category. It's about the, almost the last man stand, last team standing, yeah. and that sense of you start in April and you finish in the end of September to try and win. You know, a trophy which isn't the financially the biggest trophy. Do you know what I mean in terms of T20, mm. all that kind of stuff? But it, it meant so much to win 2019 for me personally and that's it, it, it's strange and well I, I love that at Yorkshire we won the league in 2000 or 2001 and I I would I mean 05 is obviously whatever but to win the county championship Yorkshire not won the county championship for god knows how many years mm. before that I remember winning it at Scarborough celebrating on the balcony with the trophy probably six or seven thousand Yorkies in there celebrating this win it was uh, an incredible moment you know it's it is the hardest trophy to win that county championship without any question. You, know, you, you it, won it in between Surrey won in 99, 2000, 2002, and you won it in the middle, didn't yeah, you, I think? Yeah, so we had you know, Sack Lane around Sackling, that time. Yeah. We just, so well, there was just, something, so what it means is that there were some very good teams yeah. around you so to, to win that. 
must have felt like an incredible achievement. Yeah, as and well. it's it's funny because uh, you know in, in, when you say you know something like oh, your friends in cricket, I've got, of course my, the England team that I had and was involved. And I'm, I'm good friends with with lots of them, but you know the, the players like Anthony McGrath that I came up through Yorkshire, Matthew Wood and uh, Gavin Hamilton, uh, players that I came through kind of the academy and through the kind of second eleven and straight into the first team. You know, they're the kind of people that you remember. You know, Richard Blakey played so much cricket with. Peter Hartley, who's now an umpire. Mm, yeah. you know, they kind of took me under their wing when I came into the first team. Martin Moxon, who was my captain. David Bias, all these kind of people that, uh, you know, people don't know too much about. But they created the foundation for me as a player. And about Darren Lehman. Darren Lehman, when he came as overseas, and Michael Bevan just brought a an Aussie mentality into... This, uh, this county dressing room, you know, they trained hard, they played aggressively, they spoke about hitting the ball and scoring. I remember Darren Lehman after one one innings with me, he said, uh, mate, can I give you some advice? I went, yeah, yeah, what, what should I look to score, pal? <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you, you're a good player, look to score, you don't have to just defend. You know, you can put a bit of pressure on the bars. I went, oh, I'll try that in the next inning. Before you know it, I started to score a bit quicker and that was just by one conversation with Darren Lehman. Do you think, right, because... We could talk. I could talk forever about like the county cricket and cricket and like the four day stuff in particular and the the memories of it. Is it's just we love it so much that we could talk about it. But actually, it's not that spe as special as we think it is. It's, a really, I mean? like, it's a really good question because, but I think there is something in it because these are entities that have been around a long, long time. So they have a continuum. You know, there are people when you arrived as a young man at Essex who would have been there. You know, Keith Fletcher, who hangs around, he's been there forever, and he was there forever before and he's linked to people who go all the way back in the past and the fans that are there some of them are 20 some of them are 92 and they're all connected to this yeah. entity the question is you know do the other entities have that same pulling power you know and I'm, I'm just asking that just putting it out there for a competition like the 100 does it mean as much for Samit Patel to win with the Trent Rockets mm. as it means to win with Nottinghamshire well, I mean, from you know, from what, what I thought, just because Trent, uh, like for, for Sam, who's been at, not since 2002, he would have formed friendship mm -hmm. with so, some of those players who are still there for years, which you can't just build in in four weeks. Mm -hmm. That's well, that's what I think. Um, on that note, we're going to leave. Are it we because done? We're, we're, you've done very, very well. That's uh, 54 minutes <laughs> since the the rain came. Uh, Agus is going to come and join us before he gets his headset. I'm just going to let you know what's happening out there, which is not a lot. The square is covered from one side to the other and the bowler's footmarks. The rain is not cascading down, but there's a, there's a strong mizzle. I can see a little bit more of the buildings away to my right, but it's a gloomy old scene. The lights are on. It's fairly unpleasant out there. And uh, we've got a changing of the guard here in the commentary box coming up. Um, but thank you so much to Alistair and Michael for giving us their insights into their retirements and what it took for them to do it, and what motivated them to do it, and how it happened. For everybody, it's different, isn't it? And uh, I wonder how it'll be for Jimmy when he does it, and when that might happen. Will he even tell anybody? Who knows?